This is Five Minutes with Languages and Cultures staff. And my guest today is Shavalin Sevetanant, a lecturer in Japanese studies. Uh, Shavalin, best would be if you introduce yourself, but you have a very interesting story. Tell us about it. Hello, hi everybody. Um, first of all, let me say my native language, Sawadika, to everybody. Um, my name is Chawalin Sevetanan from um, I'm a Thai academic teaching Japanese language and culture at an Australian university, which is Macquarie University in our department. And yeah, my research interest um, is on language and culture. So the intersection between language and culture, how culture shape um, language and vice versa. So I'm doing a lot of research on um, media um, uh, analysis. Uh, now like um, advertisement, newspaper, um, and also like everyday life um, interaction. But you're also living this in a sense, because you just mentioned um, you are Thai and you, uh, your native language is Thai, you teach Japanese, you live in Australia. So it's at least three languages that are included. Is that how your everyday life looks like? Yeah, exactly, actually. And that's the, the most popular question that um, I usually get from my student. And it usually surprised people when I told them like I'm teaching Japanese at an Austrian university and they would ask like, oh, are you Japanese? I would say, oh, no, I'm not Japanese, I'm Thai. Uh, oh my, are, is your husband Japanese? I would say, oh no, he's Chinese, but we speak Japanese at home. And how about your son? Oh, he speaks four languages. He speaks um, Japanese, Chinese, Thai, and English. And people would be, wow. But I think lately it became more common that um, I got a student who also uh, have um, uh, like, like three or four languages at home there so, so, so that kind of thing I think it became very common right now so and then I'm glad to see that happening okay so from initial three languages we actually um, added another one so Chinese being present in your household so how hard or how easy it is maybe for you to maintain it all the four languages that your son for example you mentioned speak so what, what is your advice to parents who are trying to write <laughs> bilingually yeah, I think we first it's about the attitude. So the most important thing is to value the the language of, of your heritage. So you, you don't throw it away easily just because you come to Australia and, and, and other people speak English. Thai language is not um how say a main stream. So it's a minor language in a way, but still we feel like to connect with um people of, of his heritage, he need to know the language. And the first people that he start to talk is my it's, it's myself first and then my, my parents who later moved to Australia. And then they were very happy because we could welcome them by having their grandson talking to them in Thai. So yeah, I think it, it start from the attitude and then later you, got, you, you just need to stick to, to the discipline. So whenever you, you are in a, a certain circumstance with 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 the kid. You you continue to use the same language. Yeah. So are you more one person one language type of family or one situation one language type of multilingual family? I'm the latter one. So because we still want to have a conversation among all of us, three of us. So we want to involve everybody in the conversation. That's why. If we are together, we would speak Japanese at home, which is actually not our native language for, for any of us, and, but it works very fine. And then, um, so for example, if I'm together with my son, I would speak to him in Thai. But once my husband came in, stepped in the room, we would switch to Japanese. So it mm -hmm. worked like that. You said to me earlier that actually, and you just mentioned it, your common language, your lingua franca at home is Japanese. And you live in Australia. Everybody was probably expected that it would be English. So why not English? Why Japanese? Yeah, I think there are many reasons for that. So starting from when um, the reason why I speak to my husband in Japanese, because we were both 
studying in Japan when we met. And then at that time, our English was not very good. Um, so it was a start. But when we came here and we became more fluent in English, we still feel like English is not the language that we could express our feeling and emotion the way as we feel. And we feel like um, Japanese is easier. So we stick to the language that we use um, when we met. So maybe it sounds a little bit romantic that way. <laughs> Going back to your work, and I do usually ask um, what's the best thing about your job, but you, before this interview, you mentioned to me that actually you like or you're very involved with a particular project that you're very proud of. So maybe you can tell us something about that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. So uh, my recent project that I received a grant from the from DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Trade and Affairs, is that, yeah, the DFAT project. It's a uh, um, assess, comparative assessment between um, Australia and Japan, how they respond to um, COVID-19. And usually people would think that it's more medical science, right? But um, what our project does is more about sociocultural investigation. So for example, myself would look at a language that is used to communicate with people. So look at how Australian health authority um, talk to people and look at how Thai authority talk to people and see if there is anything that we can learn from each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very timely topic still, even though we are slowly getting out of hopefully this pandemic. So what are what were the things that you missed mostly and that you can't wait to get back in back in your everyday normal daily life? First thing, and you know this will um yes that haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, 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 I was missing my hairstylist so much. And the next thing, probably a, a day trip outside of Sydney. We couldn't go out of five kilometers. So this weekend, we are planning to go to um, Central Coast um, just to get some fresh air and then go to the beach. And yeah, and at the end of the, the, the year around Christmas, we also have another trip planned for a caravan park. So yeah, something that I can look forward to. But something that during COVID you started doing that you didn't used to do before, like maybe painting or have you done a puzzle of 10,000 pieces or something like that, anything? With kids at home, I think with a, I have a kid at home, it's, it's, it's more with the homeschooling. But yeah, I think it's probably keeping... Ah, yeah, I think I did um, a, 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 a session with a personal trainer I have I never have a personal trainer before but during the lockdown I decided because the gym is closed I decided to um to have a, a session every week so I feel like now I'm so ready I'm so in a very um healthy form to tackle the world again um Shavalin, so teach me a greeting that we could end this interview with in Thai we haven't sure. that language yet. <laughs> sure. So we usually say um, so what the cap for female and so what the cap for male. So for you, you better say so what the cap. And usually um, in a formal situation, we would do this um, gesture as well. So so what the cap like this. So what the cap. Yeah. Well done. <laughs>